So it's week three, lecture five, and I'm just going to go over um, go over the exam one. There's usually a couple questions on there that trip people up. Um, did, did you want to start off with anything at all, Tim? Or it sounds like there's still a little bit of confusion over the due date. So I was going to I was going to hit the syllabus one more time, um, show my sort of overall view of the due dates, and then if you want to kind of dial in on the exact days of the week when you like to see stuff, we'll, we'll do that. So let me let me just go back and, oh, thanks. <laughs> that makes a little funny. <laughs> let me go back and remind everyone where the due dates are. So um, again, you know, first thing on the website, here's the syllabus. And all of the due dates, if you will, are right here at the bottom. So we're, we're in week three right now. So exam one is like as of 10 minutes ago, late, because week two is now over because week three started. Um, a week from today, summary one will be late because week four will have started because as you can see there, summary one is due in week three. So I can't make it a whole heck of a lot simpler than that. Tim, I think, had a few little minutiae in terms of the actual days of the week when he would like to see things turned in. So do you want to just go over that, Tom? Um, I'm just starting with on Thursday of the week that is due, it'll open up at the end of this class. So if it's due, um, obviously the summary is going to be due by next Tuesday by the time class starts. So you're going to be able to start submitting it this Thursday, Thursday. at 1500 when this yeah. class is over. Yeah. The reason we started talking about it last Thursday is this week is for you to use the forum to get your paper in there, get it peer reviewed by everybody else, and then have and work on it. So you have time to work on it so it's ready to go Thursday. But I'm not even going to start looking at them until next Tuesday. That's when I'll start grading them. That's when the cutoff is. Um, there is a provision in there if something happens and you forget about it, it's totally spaced or whatever, and you don't turn it in until, you know, a week from Thursday. There's a provision, but every day after next Tuesday, you lose 10% every day that it's late. So that provision's only there for a couple days, and even then expect a very low return on your uh, on your paper. Yeah, so, so this... I think there was just some confusion because in class last Thursday you were saying get these in by Friday night so that people have time. To well, Friday on each week, not like that's, that's this. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Give, give them in the <laughs> day after Tuesday's Tuesday. class so everybody can review them on the form over the weekend so they can be submitted on Tuesday when it actually was not due on this Tuesday today. Next week. Right. You were just saying for for every summer, make right. sure it's up there, <laughs> plenty of days in advance. Before right. Time. Yeah. Are okay. you gonna critique ours this time before? No. 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 And I, I've already addressed that with, with somebody. I don't remember who it was. I don't have time to look at each each and everybody's paper, provide you comments, and then grade it and do the same thing all over again. That's what the peer review is for. If you look, though, I've already posted up several times in that forum to give you guys good, good feedback on what's missing, what I'm seeing so far. I am watching them close this week because I want to get you guys off on the right foot. So I am watching really close. If there's, if there's something that I'm seeing consistently across the board that people are having problems with, I'm going to address it in the, in the forum so that you guys can see that and, and refer to that. Um, the most important thing is in week one, or actually I don't think it's even in week one, at the very top of the Moodle show, there's a section there that has all these different kinds of information. One of those pieces of information is how to do your guidelines for your summaries. And the mistake I see people making, um, and Brad scrolls up a little bit, and I posted that up there today, um, Right there, that last paragraph before it gets to the errors, include an identification header, the student name, course number, summary number, and date. 
period. Submit file named, last name, first initial, course number, and summary number. People are using that as their header. That is only the how you save your file to submit it. Those are two separate sentences there. So what it's going to look like, um, rather than having where where they can see on the, the folks online. Can see oh, the board. yeah. Um, well, tell tell me what you're writing there. We can just. I just want to give them a sample of what the header looks like. Oh, yeah, so it'll be sure. Their name, probably right on the board, but behind it, right? Yeah. Um, actually, where he's got on the notepad. Yeah. So, back. so you, you just want to see your your name. What else is on there? Um, Energy one hundred and one section. Summary. Uh, course number. You know. So N R G Y one O one. Um, summary one. And then um, date. Another thing too. Oh, and then, and then so your, your file name is just, is just going to be, uh, you know, Chester. It, it's, it's easier if you uh, label it that way. Um, I don't know why he's got M101. Because what happens is I'm grading these. I make my comments and stuff on there. First I save that as a new document on my desktop. And what happens is I end up with like 10 different summaries. A barrel called summary one. I don't know who's is who's, but if you save it this way, yeah, just now I can pull it right up. So I can give you in your feedback. You look at the grading. You'll it'll have your grade on there. It'll show my edited copy to you with the comments and highlights and stuff like that. Yeah. So this is this is your file name. Another another thing, um, and I think make sure I've actually got this in the. <laughs> then you actually want a header, not uh, how you post it in, say, a, a writing class where you write actually your name below it. Uh, It'll look just like what you did in writing class. So you don't want a header. You it doesn't have to be a header. As long as it looks like what Brad has up there, I don't care if it's a header or if you just typed it straight up in the document. And then below date there, centered, yeah. below that will be the title. And that is that separate. is not in there, and I apologize for that. I, what, what I'd like to see here is some kind of catchy title. So when, Summary one is not catchy, so, by the way. So catchy title. <laughs> the title of the whole line is, is that's 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 something that you that you're creative about that is is well catches the reader's eye. So somebody's gonna see that. It's going to be it's going to be enticing. It's going to want them to get a read. Just like you know, any 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 article you might see. Best damn summary. Period. That could work. Yeah, it's a lot to live up to, but you know, if you think so. <laughs> yeah. Sickles suck. That's catchy. So we. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to work with you guys on this first one, and like I said, I'm trying to give you as much information as I can in there, but don't expect me to edit each one of yours individually in the summary because that's just too much to do on top of grading and reviewing tests and yeah. we'll go. other classes I've done the same thing for. We'll, we'll, we'll go through it. And like, like Tim was saying, you know, the, the, as long as you're hitting the mechanics of the paper, we're going to hold you accountable for what we just went over. If, if gosh, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, what what's it if, if it's just if your summary just kind of call, falls flat it's not going to penalize you a whole lot, heck of a lot for that if if um if it looks like for whatever reason you panicked and plagiarized i mean then you're kind of talking student conduct issues but um just you know write it in your own words uh read the paper if if part of it was confusing it's okay to say it was confusing i mean in fact that's that's welcome say yeah, this i did not really get this at first than I did, or I'd like to learn more about this in class, or gosh, I never thought, it, it's fine to just talk about it in a sense like that. You don't have to pretend to be some expert that you're not either. It's, it's fine. Keep the dictionary handy, gentlemen. <laughs> and I actually, whose who's paper did I review online? And actually, who, was that yours? Yeah, I pulled up and I actually kind of Picked it apart. I put five or six different things in there to look out for. Um, it's not even against yours. It was actually a very well written paper, but it was missing those points that are kind of straight out of that that page right there. Yeah. The, the summary information. So 
Um, I think one of the other ones I referred you guys to go look at Todd's paper for correct sites. Um, how to correctly do a short site in the first paragraph and then do your um, credits down at the bottom of the article. Does, does it say what format we're supposed to use for that on, on this guidelines paper? As long as you're following a format, I'm okay with that. Um, okay, so MLA or 8, whatever. I, I don't even know what MLA is. Just use this right here. That, and that's for your for your end site. In your first paragraph, I want to see right there. That right there. I want to see the author and the year. And tell me that uh, a lot of you guys are writing a paper that you don't even tell me what what paper it is. I have no idea what paper you're talking about. Put the title right there in the first paragraph so I know. Hey, I read this paper by this author written last year. Yeah. And here's what it says. Oh. Cool. Thanks. So due dates are all set now, summary formats all set, super. All right. Well, let's look at the, um, let's look at the exam then. And Dave, do you mind if we just look a little bit through your exam? Yeah, go ahead. Of, okay, yeah. Sounds like you did pretty well. Yeah, I think I got 92. Oh, good, man. Oh, good. Yeah. I got Nothing to be ashamed of. Good. And I'll go ahead and um, highlight week three, since that's where we are currently. Catch myself up here a little bit. Week two, week three, boing, light bulb. All right, so exam one, 23 attempts. Wow, that's pretty good. You guys are off to a good start. Is this your 93 here? Yes. Okay. You know, I think what, what we'll see there a lot of times the first first uh, attempt is a little dicey, but usually by the second attempt you're, you're nailing it. Okay. So I'm just going to go right to the, the two that you missed. Um, of the lar five largest consumers, which has the worst consumption to production ratio? So tell, tell me what... Um, Tell me what table or figure you, you went to to, to look uh, at. Page 52. Okay. I guess it's China. 52. Okay. So I think um, well the, the, the terminology is slightly different, but you can see that there's con consumption and production. So I'm just gonna go right right into the table here. And so here's uh, produced, and here is consumed, and um, let's take a look. So what are, what are the top five, by the way? China, USA, Russian Federation, India, and Japan. Right. So those are, the, those are the top five under selected countries, China, USA. Russia, India, Japan. So I'm just going to write those numbers down. So yeah. um, Japan's almost twice as bad as USA and other things. China, US. Friend. Yeah, and I'll ask for those numbers here in a second. Uh, Japan and Canada. China. So percentage of world total. So China is producing 18% of the world's total energy and consuming 19%. Were you, were you get, can someone give me a ratio on that just while you're? 1.07. Okay. So 1.07. The U.S. is producing 15%. I'm just, I'm just rounding here. 15%. Consuming 19. What's the ratio? 1.3. 1.3. Russia's producing 10 and consuming, gosh, only five and a half. That's that's a little low. I'm surprised to hear it's that low. What's that ratio? Zero point five. Okay. Japan. Oh, sorry, did I skip India? Oh, I did. I skipped them completely, didn't I? Hang on one second. Let me get, let me get India and Japan in the right right order here. So there's India is. Man, four percent, and in consuming five, what's that number? One point three six. One point 
three, and then finally, Japan is um, producing a whopping one percent and consuming four. So what, what's what are the numbers? Five point three. Five point three. Okay, if you include the significant digits. So let's go back to that question. Uh, the worst consumption to production ratio, and you know, from from what we saw there, even though. Japan is not um, is not consuming. It's actually consuming the least of all five of those countries. Its ratio is the worst because it just produces a tiny amount. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So we're just looking at the absolute value versus the relative value, and what this question is asking is what's the relative value between the production and consumption ratios, and that you know that one that one uh, trips up. A lot of people, but you know, we, we, when we were looking at primary energy last time, we did, and I can't remember off the top of my head what um, what figure it was, but there's a nice figure that just shows the the, the bar, like a bar chart, basically uh, of the same info that's in that table. I'm not uh, I'm not mistaken. I don't have it right off the top of my head here. What did you give your Japan? Is that 5.3? 5.3. And I, I didn't, I think that, that, well, what I did is um, I divided, let's just go back to the table, 52. <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll be a little less sloppy with my significant digits here. Um, Japan. Produced 0.8 percent, and it consumed 4.3 percent. So if I pull up my calculator here and do um, 4.3 divided by 0.8 equals 5.3. I guess it would be it would actually be 5.4 if I were going to get technical and anal so, with yeah, I was doing it wrong too when I figured it out as far as I was looking at it if you compared it on a ratio of to 100 for both US would be 25% difference whereas Japan would be way more than that oh well uh, so you're looking at it on a on a Japan is still going to come out worse, though, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the yeah. Idea. Sure. It had to be Japan of the rest of them. Sure. Sure. No matter how you slice it, Japan Japan's the, the worst off. But I see. I got to divide the consume by the produced. Yeah. Now, j just looking at this, you can do this exact same math on an individual house. You know, if you got your solar, you got your wind, etc. What, what's your production to consumption ratio? So, you know, we're obviously looking at this on a global level, but these same exact numbers, calculations, if you're out there in the field, you're trying to size somebody's PV, size somebody's wind, you're going to have to do the same exact math all day long just for an individual house. At, you know, add it all up at the end of the day, and, and there's your country statistic, more or less. So, this is, you know, this is, this is fun, you know, fun, fundamental to, to what we're doing. Was there one other question, though? Sorry, or I, was, I was just in the middle of doing something else, and I got... Oh, I was looking for some figure that showed the RP ratios um, for different countries. Maybe, maybe it's later in the book, but it was... And we'll, we'll also get into that more in, in Summary 3. We're, we're looking at how many more days, years, etc. we have left of the various primary energies. It, it could be that I'm thinking about a chart in, um, in 102. Maybe that's a 102. But you could imagine um, looking at each one of these, these numbers and realizing, okay, how long until this primary energy is, um, is lost? Oh, you know what? I know why. Because we haven't really looked at the reserves yet. We haven't really looked at how much primary energy is actually left in the ground. So we'll, we'll get to that later. Okay. Um, So the next one, 21, all right, is, it, is this the one you missed, 21? Yes. Okay, 
They're difficult to quantify according to the authors of your text, blankety blank, is understood to be the total energy content embodied in a natural resource prior to any manipulation by human systems. So before we discussed the correct answer, was, was that kind of a guess, or was that something that you remembered from lecture, or? Well, I read what primary energy was in the book, and that did not okay. relate in my head to what the question was. It didn't seem like that it was the same thing at all. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. I missed that question. Huh. Um, because I read all of them, and, the, and I couldn't... Yeah, energy density energy is energy definitely not a that's, you know, of, of an area. Yeah. Original energy, it does kind of talk about that on page 36, but that's not it either. Energy hmm. is definitely not it, since hmm. it's blanks. Yeah, well, I... I apologize. I thought I was very clear yeah. on that in, the other thing, in lecture. Right under primary energy is specific energy, so I thought you were referring to specific energy as secondary energy. But I, Where do you see specific? On page 37. But that, I mean, that's, that's actually a per. Oh, yeah. That's not it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's well, um, let's, let's just Let's just take a look here. I mean, I'm, the, I mean the, the title of the chapter is, in fact, Primary Energy. And I'm just going to read right from page 36 and just see where the confusion uh, might have come in. So the word primary means the earliest um, original and common feature of all the primary energy sources that are naturally occurring. Um, well, I guess I, would, I guess I would see that word naturally occurring uh, stores, well, I guess I would read that as, you know, prior manipulation. I guess, I guess you could say can... content, content bodies would be listed under energy carries. Is that the relation there? Well, I mean, the answer is primary energy. And we've not even started discussing secondary energy at all. And secondary energy is what happens to primary energy as it's being run through an energy technology. So, for example, Electricity is an example of secondary energy. So we get the primary energy from Mother Earth, from the sun, from the waves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's kind of all we were given, and that's what was sort of here prior to um, humans interacting with it. So we didn't, I guess, all we talked about was primary energy. We didn't even really talk about any of these other things at all, so secondary energy. Oh, is that even discussed? I don't even... Anyway, I guess... Because if you look on 37 where it says the term primary energy, it, doesn't, yeah. it just says comparison and estimation, not actual what, you know, is yeah. embodied. Well, no, I, I guess... Or manipulation, because sure. obviously if you're comparing this stuff, you're, you haven't manipulated it in some way, right? Yeah. Now that I know it and read that paragraph, it does stick out to me. Yeah, I mean, it, what it is. Right. It's, I guess I would just go right back to that that first paragraph right under the subtitle, What is Primary Earliest Energy? Or original. Earliest original. And for that, it's like, yeah. pr pr and I think the word, um, you know, prior to manipulation. Prior. So yeah. I guess that's, that's how I'd put those two words together. You're going to find that in all these tests in this program. It's not just this class, there's a lot of classes. The initial answer that jumps out in, in your face uh, is probably not mm -hmm. the right one. Um, probably you're going to have to dig a little bit deeper. You know, and be careful because the book does say, you know, it has primary energy listed there several times. It's not really specific, but you're going to have to combine those and kind of extrapolate what is, what is primary energy. Um, did this one give anybody problems? The calorie? Ken, yeah. Um, remember the, the, uh, the, the big C is a kilocalorie. That's the one we talked about the first day in lecture. That's your 10, uh, 10 megajoules. 20, 2,500 kilocalories is what you eat um, in, a, in a day. The little C calorie, well, that's, that's just the exact definition. 
Um, how many, how many, um, how many grams of water would one kilocalorie raise one degree Celsius? A thousand. thousand grams, kilogram, yeah, a that liter. Was one, that was one of the other yeah. questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the, It was, it was, the answer was kilocalorie or something like that. I got it correct, but there was two answers. One where it had the, the, the actual digit one, oh. kilocalorie, and the other one said one kilocalorie, which I was assuming was the same thing, but I didn't know what format. Well, and, but and, it had a reverse. and it had a reverse. You had one of them was calorie with a capital C, and one of them was calorie with, with a small, small C. C. But then one was spelled out one. And yeah. one was the digit one. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so which one was correct? Said it was wrong. The the, the number one. Yeah, the number one. Like because I got it wrong last time I took it. <laughs> I think I selected the actual. I don't remember. I don't really the the written one, and I got it correct. I thought. Yeah, I got it wrong. If you picked the number one calorie, that was the right answer. Maybe I got it wrong and switched on the second try. No. That's right there, number ten. If you got that mark wrong, um, but you put down oil, um, that's one of those little nuances of Moodle that um, we had like somebody wrote oil at 32.8%. Yeah. yeah, that's what I And said. it marks it wrong because it only wants to see oil, not all the other. Uh, well, yeah. So I went through there and checked, and if you had that answered correctly, I looked at everybody's test. If you had that one, if you had oil in there, I fixed it. Yeah. Cool. I, don't I, don't might be was, better than what you saw. I think it was close to the end of the of the, of the test with that one. The other ways is different, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did. It scrambles the. It was more correct though. This one. Yep. Yes. Yeah, four. Is E and A? They're both right. Okay, that's what I was asking. They're both they're, right. They're, they're both the, the capital, which is kilo, but one is represented as a numerical one or a written one. They're both correct, yeah. Okay, a, a, I was stressing on the same one. That's probably not fair on my part, I'll, I'll give you so that. So I referred back yeah. to the book where they wrote out one and, yeah. and used yeah. the digit one. So. Yeah. They, they're both correct. Um, one thing worth mentioning, though, in your writing, if you've got a, a small number, like typically any number between 1 and 10 is, is written out rather than enumerated. That's just kind of conventional English. So the, the English uh, department would, would say that E is more correct than A, but technically they're both correct. They're, they're, they're the same answer. Really? Okay. So anything under 10, you typically write it out as opposed to use the numerical? Yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of easier to do. It's a blood count. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. That's 982. Yeah. 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 That's five words. It takes <laughs> to move like a gallon of water or something like that. By, and I didn't know if it was supposed to be a term or if that was a calculation. I don't see the word gallon in here anywhere. There was one where you had the. It was the British thermal units one. Um, yeah, it was EU. A pound of water? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the definition of one BTU. Oh, I could not find that. Oh, um, yeah, I'm sure it's in there. Yeah, British. Just looking for a definition. British book, they just can't, they, they can't. Uh, it's on, on page 42. They say they have stones. <laughs> okay, yeah, so. Um, B, so the BTU, it, it actually is one of those titles and originally defines the heat energy needed to warm one pound of water by, by one yeah, degree Fahrenheit. Yeah, okay. What was the answer for the question that says all energy sources need to be heated to a certain The other ones as factors or forms, but it's actually listing. Uh, That's where I made the mistake. Solar and then the other ones. Yeah, where it it sounds like it's listing all the other ones as forms of solar. Yes, yeah. this tidal power is uniquely derived from the Earth and the Moon, not solar. 
Yeah, that was one of the options. We just we discussed that, but very briefly in in lecture. Uh, what, was tithe an option or was it win? I thought it was win. They were both options. Is wave and tithe the same thing? I'm no. 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 Okay, so that's why because it said wave, not tithe. Correct. Yep. Okay. We we discussed that pretty pretty briefly too. So wave would be. I, just another term for hydro? No. Wind, no. Wave is by wind. Uh, hydro is falling water to the head. Yeah. So, um, when, and I think this is this is going back to. Um, oh, here's the here's the. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of people automatically just thought oil. Not the first time. <laughs> yeah, the second time. <laughs> Um, said, nope, I, I, I know I'm right, and that test must be wrong. <laughs> 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 I sent a nasty email. No, I wanted to. I was like, no, it's oil. I see all the rest of these listed. Can you explain how that? Yeah, for sure. So, um, and, and again, it's if, if you look at figure 1.9, and we, we discussed figure 1.9 fairly extensively, and um, and you can see hydroelectric power there. There's a there's a shot, and I can I can bring it up here while we're talking about it. Figure one point nine is it's a good good talking point. Yeah, this is critical. So, hydroelectric, you know, fairly obviously there is 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 indirect solar, right? We we talked about how uh, this fraction of solar energy goes into basically moving water molecules uphill, just evaporation. Uh, they get high enough, cold enough, turn into clouds. That water condenses, falls as rain, backs up behind a dam, and there there's your sun as hydro at work. Um, the next one, wind, and I think that's given graphically as well, so that's just due to thermal gradients as the, as the earth spins, shadows, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, ocean currents move, you're going to have some kind of thermal gradient. Anytime you have a hot air mass, it's going to try to move towards that uh, colder air mass, et cetera, and there's your, there's your wind. So that's indirect, that's your in, indirect solar. Um, wave power as well. Um, so the the tides, there's no um, there's no beam of sunlight coming here. It's just saying that's another primary energy source. That's what's being discussed. But waves are mentioned right here as a result of thermal gradients in the atmosphere as well. You know, causing the well the wind causes the waves. Right. So again, indirect, and then. Um, oil, well, I think we all know that story. That was all from ancient photosynthesis. That was the problem we did in the first basically 15 minutes of class uh, in week one and, and decided that, yeah, all cars are solar cars because they run on oil, which comes from the sun. <laughs> the other one that I missed both times is the fundamental source of solar energy is. Oh, we'll take a look at that. Um, and then, but geothermal comes from a couple different, couple different sources. It's not... And um, you know, it's it's not it's not called out here directly, and there's no sunbeam um, doing that. All of the the geothermal energy that we experience, well, it's, it's from one of three fundamental sources. Um, one is just residual friction from the initial impact when the planet was formed. So when the planet was forming, and large chunks of matter were smacking into each other. There's a lot of residual heat there, and the, the um, Earth's core is still liquid. There can also be residual geothermal from friction from uh, plates sliding past each other. So just you know, rub your hands past each other. There's some heat. Same exact thing happens when um, tectonic plates slide past each other. And then uh, the, the the third source of geothermal energy would be radioactive decay. Uh, and that's exactly how we harness 
nuclear energy in a, ra in a nuclear reactor is from radioactive decay and, and heat. So there's some geothermal too. And along with that sliding of plates, there's also flexing from gravitational pull from the moon, from mm -hmm. the sun, mm -hmm. causes the earth is not completely, you know, perfectly round. And that flexing yeah. causes so, yeah, some, some deformation. Yeah, some deformation. Yeah, that's, a, that's another good one too. I forgot about that one. Okay. And then, sorry, uh, Rain, you said you had one other, one other question you were... Yeah, the other question that I missed both times, I, I think I figured it out, but okay, the fundamental okay, so. source of solar energy is, I started out with geothermal energy, because what I read sounded like that, and then it also said nuclear fission, but I'm assuming what it is is gravitational energy, which drives nuclear fission of hydrogen into helium. Yeah, and I, well, I guess we could, I, I do, I did mention that in lecture, maybe I should spend a little more time on it. Um, But, so, so well, go, go back early enough in the solar system, our, our solar system and all of the elements in it are the result of an ancient supernova explosion. So all of the heavier elements that we see are, are the result of some other ancient star that collapsed and basically fused enough hydrogen into helium, helium into lithium, on up the, on up the ladder, basically all the way until you get to, um, <clears throat> to iron. Iron is sort of the, the bottom of that fusion scale. Once a star starts making iron, it's more or less consumed all its fuel and then will more or less explode. That explosion can actually create higher fusion or, or heavier elements, so making uraniums and things like that that are now even less stable. Um, and then, so it's kind of, you know, spread throughout the universe. Our solar system was a result of, of an explosion recondensing, and that's just gravity pulling all that matter back together. Um, and our, our sun being most, well, for the majority, hydrogen. Uh, it's just the gravity is, in fact, squishing that into helium. When those nuclei get close enough together, they fuse. When the fusion happens, you get uh, photons being released, and that's, that's the photons that we see as light. So, uh, yeah, and so that's that's what's coming out of the sun, and it's not, and so it's not, and, and fission, which is which is the second answer there. B fission would be a heavier element splitting into lighter ones, but on the on the sun, it's. Um, lighter elements fusing into heavier ones. And for whatever reason, iron kind of sits at the bottom of that uh, well. Okay, any other questions on uh, exam one? Uh, we'll miss the two false for geothermal. Oh. Being an unlimited resource. Okay. Um. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? You'd be surprised. Oh. Some people, again, they were sure. Right there. Geothermal is... Or they didn't mark down that that was one that they got wrong. Didn't fix it. That could be too. Well, okay. So that, that's a little bit tricky. I mean, geothermal is renewable, but it's not um, inexhaustible. Um, so you're saying if we put enough <coughs> geothermal systems in, we can draw all the heat out of the Earth's core. Now, the way the book, the, the way it read from the book, and they did leave it slightly open, but it basically said that. Um, well, so there's, there's, a couple different, there's a couple different ways to look at that. Um, and, well, let's, let's just take a look. Let's just take a look. So, the... But, you know, basically we're, we're going, you know, we're going from hot to um, cold. And the, so most of the geothermal that we're going to experience is just, are, are things that are happening in the Earth's crust, you know, relatively close. You might have an, an instance where, uh, you know, Yellowstone, for example, where this hot stuff actually is fairly close to the surface, right? Um, and, you know, in, in practical terms, no, humanity will probably not suck all of the heat out of the, uh, out of, out of the earth. But 
it is possible to extract heat from a geothermal resource faster than it can be replenished. So there's always sort of this uh, conductive or convective or even radiant gradient happening. We haven't, we haven't discussed the three modes of heat transfer yet, but you know, heat is basically flowing from the outside of the earth, or sorry, from the inside of the earth to the outside. And as it turns out, and we'll get into this in more detail in 102, as it turns out, the earth actually radiates at something like um, six, 60 milliwatts per square meter. Pretty small compared to the rate that the sun radiates, just because just, just it's cooler. But the earth is, in fact, radiating you know, at a relatively modest amount. Uh, but so you could imagine that if you had uh, your geothermal tubing, you know, sitting underground, and you're, you know, pumping fluid down, you know, pumping, uh, you know, cold fluid down, pumping hot fluid up, if you're doing it at a rate that's faster than this, at some point you're just, you're just spinning your wheels, more or less. You're not going to get any more out of it than uh, is, is there, so. So if you put in, you know, the maximum size well for that location, and you try to put a system above ground that draws it more than you would exhaust. Yeah, there's just, you there's exhaust just a that well because you're, you're putting too much, too big of a too big of a system. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You could you could definitely oversize it. Um, will it replenish eventually? Probably. You know, maybe. I mean, this 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 natural phenomena will will not turn off. You know, not in our lifetime. So uh, it, w might it replenish itself? Probably. Maybe. You know, and and. Faster certainly than a uh, fossil fuel would. So, yeah. does that make sense in terms of geothermal? You know, we're kind of always we're just sort of sitting in this thermal stream, if you will, and just like we could go out and suck more water off of the Clark Fork than is actually coming downstream, the same is true of geothermal. Suck more heat off than is flowing into it. You can exhaust the temperature. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's the same way. You know, we, we could go down there with a giant hose, and, you know, suck all the water out of the Clark Fork right now. But you know, turn around an hour later, it's gonna it's gonna come back. So. Okay. Any other questions on the first exam? Yeah, and that that's one. I, I the others I I know I covered in some detail. This might have been one that I did, did not cover in too much detail and prepared you for, but. And it, and it does sound like what was in the book was a little little nebulous, but hopefully now you've got a good grasp on what's going on there. And we've got a whole course on geothermal too, so there's plenty more, plenty more that's came from. And if anybody has, if you're going to do the test and you're like, man, I'm sure I'm reading it right out of the book and I'm sure that answer is right, let Brad or I know that, hey, I'm, I'm sure I have the right answer here and it's marking it as wrong because it may be like that little shell where yeah. I correct it. Don't count on me to check every test on every question on every test to make sure that you didn't get misgraded. So let me know if you're like the one that said oil and you know it's oil because you read it right out of the book, but it marked it wrong. Let us know because we can fix it if it's you know, being correct. Yeah. And if you do the, the exam well enough in advance before the, you know, the deadline, if you take it the first time and you say, I think that is, before you take it, before I take it the second time, I should just you know, shoot me an email. Yeah, time. shoot me an email. You know, and even, and let, let's say, even. Maybe we don't get back to you in time. At least you've got a nice written record of that. And you can say, well, I told you, and we can, we can go back and fix it. So we'll, we'll, we'll play fair on that. OK, any other about power. Sure. Yeah. Glad you asked. Well, I, I told you we'd talk about power and energy every single lecture, right? <laughs> All right, power is, all right. Uh, all right. Well, I'm just, I'm just going to skip right to the chase. Um, the capacity to do work is energy. That, that's what energy is. So, and, and as we know, energy and power are not the same thing. So, uh, so why isn't I? I was just confused because the F, because the definition of power is the rate of doing work. Mm -hmm. 
Let me let me read through this one more time. Make sure it's not too confusing. All right. Well, um, so power is measured. So, like, first of all, just look at D, and, we, and like, so, so. Um, No, I yeah. So, so, so power is measured in watts. We know that's correct. We, we, we've covered that. So, uh, power is d. Um, uh, power is the rate at which work is done. It's, that's energy divided by time. So that's the rate. So that so power is f. Um, the rate at which energy is converted from one form or another. You know, we talked about conservation of energy going from kinetic potential. So C is correct. Um, mass times length squared over time cubed. I think we talked we talked about the fundamental units and dimensions of energy. So that one is correct as well. And the only one left over. It, the, you know, the the logic is a little a little bit weird, but well, A is pretty much the definition of energy. Um, well, E is the definition of energy, and A cites E as the only incorrect answer. So, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. So, there are a lot of different ways to describe and define power and energy and work, but, and, and, then, and again, this is just kind of like <coughs> digging into the, the technical aspects, so. So it's not, it's not nebulous. I mean, it's, it's an actual physical thing that we can physically define. And then the, the cold, ton of coal equivalent. Okay. Is that just because, was the answer at 28 gigajoules? No, that's where, that's where, they, that's where they chipped you up. It was, was 4.2 instead of 42. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you talking about this one, Todd? Question 18? Yeah. A ton of coal equivalent. Um, 28 gigajoules, then that's what's uh, in the textbook. So, so yeah. So is the E energy released by combusting a metric ton, but is that just because the 28 gigajoules is a better answer? Um, well, uh, A is correct. C, C is correct. Uh, TCE, ton coal equivalent, is also correct. Um, is a unit measure that can be used to express the energy content of variety coal capacity. Is correct also. <laughs> oh, so uh, since all of the answers okay. are correct, then so is so B is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I should say all of the other answers, including this answer, are correct. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a pair of, wait, is this, is this one wrong? Because it's... <laughs> but it's, it's not, it's, it's, um, it's, it's correct until you answer it, right? And once you answer it, then it's incorrect. Technically, it does say all of the other answers. I know. So let's, uh, let's just pause there. The, uh, the 28 gigajoules, in the book it talks about hard coal and lignite, and then it only mentions that it's been adopted by the book in UK statistics. It doesn't necessarily say that it was agreed to be equal to 28 Yeah, where, where are you reading that? That can be a little... Page 42. 42. Yeah, let's just take a look. Yeah, because it says it all depends on... The type of coal and there's like... Yeah. Nine, it's yeah, true. I should read that and I said, well, basically, since we're kind of yeah. that. It says 28. Right, it just, it, right. it just kind of blather on there for a little while, units based on coal, and then after the blathering, that last paragraph, however, National Energy, blah, 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 um, the figure in UK statistics. Yeah, and, and Boyle being the author in UK, so yeah, that's how I would read that. Because it, yeah, it does say uh, the world average is about 20. And then, and then it says 28 is used in the UK. But right, there we go. So, yeah. So the, the Brits are just being optimistic. 
All the others are inferior. Better <laughs> coal. <laughs> All right. Well, um, glad we got that first exam under our belts. I think you kind of know what to expect now. It's and it's never perfect. There's a lot of it is confusing, and it's part of it's there to. I think it's designed to make you think, not just read definitions. Yeah. Out yeah. Yeah. There you go. Good. Well. Well stated. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to pause that. We got